Hi, I recently reviewed these two lab power supplies from Unit T. The one on the left is the UDP4303S, a linear power supply, and the one on the right is the UDP6953B, which is a switching power supply. A couple of questions commonly asked by many hobbyists is that what are some of the key differences between these two types of power supplies, and which one should I get? In this video, I'm going to try to answer these questions. Before we go any deeper, let me briefly explain how linear power supplies and switching power supplies work. So linear power supply, as its name suggests, essentially uses a linear component, such as a transistor, operating in its linear region to drop the input DC voltage to a predetermined level. So fundamentally, it's equivalent to a variable resistor in series with the output. Of course, the negative feedback loop ensures that the output voltage is well regulated. As for a switching power supply or a switching mode power supply, as the name indicates, it has a switching mechanism built in. And the switch rapidly switches the input DC voltage on and off, and the output gets converted into lower voltage via a pulse transformer. The output then is rectified again and filtered into DC. By adjusting the duty cycle of the switching signal through some kind of pulse width modulation or PWM, the output voltage can be adjusted. Of course, there are many types of switching power supplies, but that is the basic idea. So just by these simple descriptions, we can already see a few main differences between these types of power supplies. The first difference, which is quite obvious, is the weight of the power supply for similar output power. For a linear power supply, the mains voltage is stepped down via a mains frequency transformer. Because of the mains frequency is relatively low, the transformer itself is much larger and heavier compared to the transformer used in a switching power supply, as the latter switches at a much higher frequency. You may be asking why this is so. Well, transformers can be made much smaller at higher frequencies because the transformer core size and the number of windings can be reduced while maintaining the same power transfer capability, because the magnetic flux that is needed to transfer the same power is inversely proportional to the operating frequency. So typically, your linear power supplies tend to weigh a lot more than the switching power supply of similar power rating. The UDP4303S on the left, for example, has a rated maximum power of just under 300 watts. Yet, it is more than double the weight of the UDP6953B, which can handle 600 watts. Because linear power supplies use mains frequency transformers, they can only accept certain input voltages, and the primary windings need to be reconfigured in order to handle different input voltages. And you can see this from the physical voltage selector switches on linear power supplies. For switching power supplies though, they typically are designed to handle a wide range of input voltages, say from 100 volts to 240 volts, and usually there is no need to select the input voltage. Everything is handled automatically in circuitry. The next difference, which should also be quite obvious as well, is the efficiency of the power supply. And because the linear component is equivalent to a resistor, Ohm's law applies. So when the input voltage is fixed, the lower the output voltage, the higher the voltage drop across the linear component, and therefore the more energy is dissipated within the linear power supply as heat, and thus the energy efficiency is poor. And I can demonstrate this. I just connected an electronic load to the output of the UDP4303S, and this is a power supply we're going to be taking a look at first. I had also hooked up a kilowatt so we can actually monitor the power goes into the power supply. For this specific test, I'm just going to use a single channel and currently is configured to output 3 volts. And the electronic load currently is configured to draw 3 amps. Right now the electronic load is on, let me turn on the power supply. As you can see that as soon as the power supply is enabled, we're drawing 3 amps, currently is displayed on the electronic load. You can see that the input power jumped to 73 watts, although we're only drawing 9 watts on the power supply here. Now let me increase the output voltage and see what we get on the kilowatt here. So let me go to voltage and let's go one volt at a time. Four, five, you can see that is actually constant, which is what I was expecting as the input voltage remains the same. And right now you can see, of course, the load is drawing 18 watts. Of course, the efficiency improved because the output voltage increased. Seven, eight, and you do see at some point the input power assumption went up. Now, I suspect that the transformer used in the UDP4303S must have multiple output winding tabs at different voltages. So based on the selected output voltage, it can choose the lowest voltage tab 
so that the maximum power dissipation within the linear power supply can be reduced. And let's keep increased output voltage and see if we have another jump somewhere. So 9 volts, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and you can see we are still at 102 watts. 15, 16, 17, yeah, you can see now the input wattage jumped again. So let's keep increasing. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So it appears we have at least three different taps for the input voltage selection. 29, 30, 31, 32. For most high-end lab-grade power supplies, having multiple transformer taps is actually quite common. Since we did not hear any relay clicking sound when switching the output voltage, I assume the UDP4303S is using some sort of solid-state relays for the task. So right now, you can see we're at a pretty efficient spot. We are essentially consuming 96 watts, and the power supply is dissipating 166 watts. While still not ideal, but this is probably the highest a linear power supply can get because of the linear component inside. So let me drop the output voltage again, and let's just get to the next level here. So let's see, before we make the jump, so that's roughly, of course at 28 volts, we just switch to the higher input voltage, and here you can see we're dissipating 84 watts within the load, but we are actually dissipating 166 watts from the input, so that's roughly 50%. This means that 80 watts is wasted within the power supply, dissipated as heat. But even with multiple transformer taps, you still cannot avoid the high power dissipation entirely. For example, if the voltage interval between the taps is 20 volts, and the maximum current allowed is 5 amps, the maximum power dissipation within the power supply is still going to be 100 watts. So linear power supplies tend to have much larger heat sinks, which in turn adds to the overall bulkiness and weight as well. Anyway, now let's take a look at the same load condition with the UDP 6953B. And just to remind you before I turn on the output, the electronic load is still configured to draw 3 amps. So let me turn on the output. And here we're showing 3 amps. The output voltage currently is at 3 volts. So the power dissipation is 9 watts, but currently we're drawing 51 watts. Still not ideal, but the power dissipated in the power supply is actually significantly less in this case. If you recall, we're dissipating 70-some watts. Right now, we're only dissipating 50-some watts in the switching power supply. Then now, let's increase the output voltage here. So let's do 1 volt at a time. And you can see that. Right now, we are only enjoying slightly more on the input side, but we are already dissipating 27 watts. So let me keep increasing. And now you can see at 32 volts output, we're drawing roughly 96 watts from the load. And the power supply input is actually drawing roughly 138 watts. So that efficiency is significantly better than the linear power supply. Now, keep in mind that this is actually a general purpose switching power supply. It can output voltages from 0 volts all the way up to 150 volts. So the efficiency here is not the greatest. For dedicated fixed voltage output switching power supplies, the efficiency can be very high. It is not uncommon for the efficiency to be above 90%, and sometimes can be even higher than that. So because of the low efficiency and heavy weight, you rarely see lab-grade linear power supplies above 600 watts. But it's quite common to see switching power supplies in the kilowatt range. And the next point is actually somewhat related to the efficiency, and that is the output voltage range. As I just mentioned, to improve efficiency, high-end linear power supplies use multiple taps on the transformer secondary to limit the maximum power dissipation within the linear regulator. But the more taps you have, the more complexity. For this reason, you rarely see the adjustable voltage range of a high current linear power supply to be greater than around 60 volts. But for switching power supplies, it doesn't have the same constraints. This UDP 6953B, for example, has adjustable output range up to 150 volts. Another advantage of switching power supply, especially for high-powered ones, 
is that the power factor correction is usually built in. Linear power supplies actually have pretty poor power factors due to the large smoothing capacitors. I actually made a dedicated video on this topic, and you can check it out in the card above or in the link below. But let me actually demonstrate this quickly here. For the first test, I'm using a 100 ohm resistor to load down the power supply, and you can see at an output voltage of 32 volts, the power consumption is roughly 10 watts, and the power factor currently measured is at 0.92, which is pretty good. Now, using the linear power supply with the exact setup, you can see here we're only getting a power factor of 0.71. From what I have shown you so far, you might be thinking that switching power supplies seem to be advantageous. Well, in terms of power, size, efficiency, and good voltage regulation over a wide range of input voltages, yes, they are absolutely great. However, there are a few drawbacks that you should be aware of. The biggest one, perhaps, is the ripple and noise. Linear power supplies have superior ripple and noise performance. Take the Unity UDP4303S, for example. The ripple and noise is specified as less than 2 mV peak to peak. And if you take a look at the specs for the UDP6953B, you will see that the ripple and noise is specified as 50 mV P2P, which is over 20 times higher than the UDP4303S. Of course, the ripple and noise for switching power supplies also have a wide range. For some low power switching power supplies, such as the Unity UDP6922B, for example, the noise is actually significantly lower. It's specced at just around 5 mV P2P. But as the power and output voltage range increases, the ripple and noise will become more prominent. The 50 mV noise and ripple spec for the UDP 6953B is actually pretty good, considering the other specifications. Let's actually take a look at the noise and ripple on an oscilloscope. To properly test the noise and ripple actually requires some careful setup. Now ideally, we'll need to use a very short ground probe adapter and measure at the output terminal right here. But even then, the measurement condition is still not ideal. Since we're only doing comparisons, I'm just going to use a BNC adapter and connect a power supply output to the scope directly. And we're also loading it down with a load resistor, as you can see the setup here. So at least our measurement will be in the ballpark, especially for comparison purposes, I think that would be fine. And first we're going to measure the output ripple of the UDP4303S. Currently, the horizontal of the scope is at 100 milliseconds per division. I think we can make it slightly faster. Let's do 20 milliseconds. And the vertical currently you can see is at 20 millivolts per division. So that should be good. Of course, you can see here, we also have limited bandwidth to 20 megahertz. And here is the baseline we're looking at. With everything off, we're still getting some noise. But let's ignore that. And now let me turn on the power supply. And you can see that the maximum barely changed. And we don't need to go into the details as we're just doing a comparison here. So let's remember this is roughly at less than one division here. So let me turn it off. And let me actually switch this to the switching power supply. And by the way, we're setting exactly the same condition. We're outputting 32 volts. And you can see, even with the power supply off, right now we're getting much higher ripple and noise on this switching power supply. And that's somewhat to be expected. Of course, right now, the maximum is around 20 millivolts. So let's actually turn it on. And once I turn it on, you can see that the maximum ripple and noise gets significantly higher. It essentially almost doubled what we had before. So right now it's sitting at roughly 40 millivolts. As I mentioned earlier, the test setup is not ideal, of course, so the number you got is probably going to be different from what is spec. Nevertheless, because the test setup is essentially the same between the linear power supply and the switching power supply, you can still use this to judge the difference between the output ripple and noise. And you can see it for yourself, the measure of ripple and noise is much higher on the switching power supply. Besides noise and ripple, Linear power supplies typically have very high power supply rejection ratio compared to switching power supplies, especially in the low frequency range. Now, one example of why ripple and noise might be important is suppose you are doing, for example, an RF circuit and you have some requirement on the spur. For example, now if you see a spur on the spectral analyzer while you're doing some verification, you wanted to make sure that that is not coming from your power supply. And for a linear power supply, this is easy to do, but for a switching power supply, it's relatively complicated. So sometimes you want to be absolutely sure the noise is not introduced by your power supply. 
And that's just an example. You could be spending tons of time trying to troubleshoot something that actually was not originated from your RF circuitry design, but rather from the power supply. And another advantage of a linear power supply is that it has great transient response. The transient response for switching power supplies are generally not as fast. So let me actually show you that. For this test, I'm using the transient mode of the electronic load. Here is the setup. The load is rapidly switching between 1 amp and 3 amp at an interval of 100 millivolts. And let's take a look at how these power supplies behave with this type of dynamic load. So the first one I'm obviously going to test is the UDP 4303S. And let me turn on the power supply. And of course, I will turn on the electronic load. And there's some ripple noise as we saw earlier, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the transient here. So let's turn on the load. And you can see that we get this transient response captured on the scope, and the swing is within 20 millivolts. So let's just remember that, and now I'm going to power it off. I'm going to switch it to the switching power supply here. Of course, the ripple is a lot higher here, but anyway, let me turn on the electronic load. And you can see here, of course, the ripple and noise is a lot higher on this switching power supply, which we already know. But the transient is also a lot worse compared to the UDP 4303S. And you can see that we got much higher voltage swings on the scope compared to what we had before. Besides the transient, generally speaking, linear power supplies also have better voltage regulation accuracy as well. So as you can see, there are pros and cons to linear power supply and switching power supply. Ultimately, using one over the other is based on the use case at hand. For an electronics hobbyist, if you are interested in analog circuitry, you will for sure need a good lab-grade linear power supply, as it has good precision and low noise. In some applications, such as high-precision analog-to-digital converters, audio amplifiers, or RF circuitry, a low-noise power supply is a must-have. If you are mainly working with digital circuitry, or you are just using power supplies to charge your batteries, you can probably get by with just using a switching power supply. But if you are serious about electronics, you should at least have one lab-grade linear power supply. These are just rules of thumb, and sometimes you do see exceptions, as there are usually other considerations as well. In my opinion though, you can never have too many power supplies. I'm sure you will be accumulating quite a few of these along the way. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.